Well, hi, Mike. It's good to see you. Good to see you too, sir. Thanks for taking time to, to be here uh, for the conversation right. with me, with Daft. Um, I'm trying to think of the last of the, the first time that we met. I know like the first like informal time we ever met was uh, at the Arab American National Museum. I think you were in town uh, for something. I don't remember what, but I was like this lonely, like paid intern, a poorly paid intern. Uh, and I remember seeing you come in and I know you were talking about some of the things you were working on. I was like, oh, I was like, that'd be really cool to like actually meet him. And I was just really shy and nervous and just kind of typing away on my keyboard or whatever. But um, what, I'm trying to think the first time we actually interacted might've been one of the programs that you, some, like that we worked on for like the film festival, I think. I think, yeah, I think it was, um, it may have been Brothers, which was, four-ish years ago, maybe five years ago now. Since we've been talking a little bit about brothers and, and things like that, and also like your, your Dearborn connection. Yeah. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about, I guess, to kind of start us off, uh, talk to me about what it's like to, I don't know if you were born or raised in Dearborn, but talk to me a little bit about like the Metro Detroit kind of connection yeah. uh, and then how that blossomed into your interest in film and theater and things like that. Uh, yes, I was born and raised in my beloved Dearborn, Michigan, my hometown of which I hold an immense amount of pride um, and at times frustration, but I think that's a healthy balance of a, of a relationship. Um, I was born at Oakwood Hospital. I lived, I grew up in East Dearborn. I spent a substantial amount of time in the south end of Dearborn because I spent a lot of time with my grandmother and that's where she lived. Um, and then in eighth grade, my parents thought it was a good idea to move to the west side of Dearborn, which essentially meant that I moved to uh, the Dearborn High, despite having grown up uh, K through eight at Lori, and which meant that all I would have gone to and all my friends went to Fortin. So uh, in hindsight, it wasn't a great idea, um, but I also often wonder, uh, my friends and I am still very, very close with many of my friends from kindergarten. And, you know, or, you know, I think what Dearborn does very well is it creates a sense of real community and loyalty amongst your friends. Um, uh, and we, I always wonder what my life would have looked like if I actually ended up going to Forza. And I think I would have probably been a singing doctor, a doctor who like, you know, loved the arts on the side. Um, but that is not what God had in store for me. And I'm grateful for the path that I've been on. Um, when I got to Dearborn High, uh, I had a wonderful, wonderful counselor who has since passed, may he rest in peace, who said to me, well, freshman Mike, you're a credit short of your freshman year, so we need to put you in another class. What would you like? And I didn't really know what to do. And he said, well, you look like you did a lot of choir in uh, at Lori. Would you like to join the choir? And at the exact moment that that happened, uh, a girl walked by the office and said, yes, join the choir. And I thought that we were in love. And so I said, yes, okay, I'll join the choir. Um, and I did. And in fact, I was in love, not with her, but with choir and singing and music. Um, and I, that just kind of was the catalyst for me. You know, I, I have had an incredible amount of handholding from uh, teachers and mentors and supporters who really, really um, lifted me up in the arts when I think my parents who certainly weren't against it, uh, they were at times against it, but I mean, for the most part, were very supportive, um, but didn't really know how to provide the emotional support um, because it was such a foreign concept to them. Um, and so it really was a product of the teachers in the Dearborn public school system, truly, I mean, I, I can tell you that when Mrs. McKnight, my kindergarten teacher, cast me as Santa Claus in the night, and the night before Christmas, like, immediately, she was like, hey, you know, you really feel like this could be something for you, and 
Paul Bruce, who is still a staple in the community, put me in a play in sixth grade, and Lisa Meyer, who was my music teacher in seventh and eighth grade. I mean, every one of those teachers still resonates quite true to me because they clearly were saw something and were very encouraging. Um, I I haven't told the story before, but it truly does make me cry to think about it. But in ninth grade, um, there were, you know, we had choir classes and then there were um, uh, extracurricular choirs, like the all boys group would meet before school to rehearse and the, the senior choir would, you know, there was just sort of other choirs that would perform. Um, and my choir teacher, Miss Maritza Madius Kalis, who I am still tremendously close to to this day, would uh, come and pick me up at six in the morning from my parents' house uh, because I took the bus to school and couldn't get to school that early and take me to school for choir practice. Um, and it just, I mean, like, had she not done that, had she not put, it, put forth that effort, um, you know, who knows if I would have been continually encouraged to be in those experiences. And then, you know, and then uh, we got a theater, a new theater director. Um, and he also was a huge and still remains to be a huge mentor in my life, Mr. Greg Viscomi. Um, and uh, again, rehearsals would go very late. My parents went to bed and he would take me home. And, you know, it just, these, all of these various people who just were there to fill a void that my parents uh, couldn't fill, not, not because they were, um, you know, defiant, but, but because they just didn't have the tools. And so all of that led me to a degree in musical theater and um, uh, a, uh, a career in New York for several years that morphed from on stage to on camera to behind the camera. Um, and then, you know, here I am in LA for the last 11 years working um, solely in the film and TV industry with some carve outs for some theatrical endeavors and uh it's it's kind of the best life ever that was so much talking was that even the question you've answered four questions in <laughs> one <laughs> yeah. i i want to talk a little bit about kind of your transition working with like theater and how that transitioned to you like being a filmmaker and it seems like you're not obviously just only in film now but you're kind of doing a mixture of both still but could you maybe talk a bit about the transition from theater to filmmaker and then how you're yeah. doing Yeah, again, it was kind of one of those things that whether I went to school for it or not, or whether there, there was no um, real linear path, you know? And, I, and I, I will tell you, and I'm sure you speak to a lot of filmmakers, there is no one path, right? So there is no like um, formula to do the thing that you want, that one wants to do. Um, so essentially, um, when I was in primarily working in the theater and in New York, in a post 9-11 world, uh, my identities of being in the arts and of being Arab and Muslim, uh, who, which I always sort of compartmentalized, right? I was like most people um, who have an intersectionality of identities. I was a really, I am still and to some degree, but much more so uh, then uh, code switched so much. I could sit at a table with my Arab friends and have a version of myself that existed in that dynamic. And then I was in my artist theater community and uh, and and there was sort of that version of Mike. And, you know, I think as we all grow up, those versions just kind of morph into the one true self. And that's cool. Um, but, it, but after 9-11, I've just found myself constantly Th those two identities, like just wanting to merge and wanting to use my skill set uh, as an artist 
to redefine, reclaim um, the narrative around what it meant to be an Arab American, a Muslim. Um, and I and I and I found an incredible community in New York who was also feeling what I was feeling. Um, and there was a thing there that I was a, a participant in for a few years called the Arab American Comedy Festival. And it was just this incredible uh, community of artists, writers, actors, directors, producers who would get together. They would do a bunch of sketches that were Arab themed, some like much more sort of uh, comedy based in the um, in, in, like in the in the realm of like family situational comedies and some more political. And I just I was just kept thinking how exciting would it be to bring this kind of material back home to a community who would watch themselves reflected back in it. And at the time, a couple of my buddies thought it would also be a good idea. And we, you know, we just sort of kind of did it. The reason why I bring that up is because in that we produced uh, in, a, in, in accompaniment to these sketches, uh, sh a short film, the first that had its own viral life called Cribs, um, Arab American style, which was uh, a film that I uh, co-wrote and produced um, for the festival. That's where, that's sort of where it originated. Um, and then subsequently after that, we did a, a bunch of MTV parodies um, in subsequent years but but i think because i because of that film and sort of it taking off in its own world people knew me not just as a theater artist but now also as a film artist um despite the fact that i you know i didn't know anything i was making it up as i went along um because that just wasn't my genre um and this was right around the time where uh, the incentive program, the tax incentive program in Michigan was quite good. And I was offered the opportunity to head up the Wayne County Film Office, which again, I had no idea what that meant, but I was like, sure, great, awesome. My nephew, my my sister's son was just born. The, the excitement around being around him in his earlier life was really um, interesting to me and exciting to me. And, um, you know, so I decided to come home and I left New York and I came home for this job and I did it for three years and I got the absolute greatest uh lesson in filmmaking on on the job like i was talking with and interacting with an incredible amount of producers and uh unit production managers and sort of the the higher above the line folk who were making uh you know and, and making the, the 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 projects and also just letting me watch how the sausage gets made um and uh from there, I met a few producers uh, who were interested in my background in Dearborn and what Dearborn was as a landscape. And they made some introductions to um, some folks at TLC that led to a pitch meeting that led to uh, me selling All American Muslim as a series to TLC. Um, and then, then I was now an executive producer on a TV show, which kind of gave me, uh, which opened a lot of doors to do a lot of different things. Um, and, uh, and from there, you know, I mean, from there, it just was, uh, a, you know, studio, studio kind of, uh, I, I, I worked in the studio system for, for many, many years up to up to right now as a result of that. Yeah, one of the things I think that I appreciate about you and other filmmakers, of course, as well, is like incorporating like pieces of your identity. Like you said, there's a lot of intersections where your identity comes, yeah. just like with a lot of folks. And I always appreciate that you <clears throat> that you put that into your film, whether it's like super obvious or maybe not as obvious in other projects, perhaps. But I really always appreciate that. Can you talk a little bit about you know, and that's also aligns very well with the work that I do with the Arab American National Museum. Can you talk a little bit about like why, like how you've been able to kind of do that successfully? I feel like, you know, and maybe this is just me as an outsider, but I feel like within Hollywood and like all these like people that you might work with that are outside of the culture, whether it's Arab, whether it's Muslim, whether it's whatever, 
may want you to show that culture, but be like, oh, why don't you have, you know, I don't know, uh, all these maybe, you know, insert stereotype. So sure. can you talk a little bit about how it how it is to like have these, you know, create films and projects around like your, your you know, identities that you connect with and what that's been like? And have you ever had anybody that's been like, hey, where are the terrorists? <laughs> why don't you include, you know, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the answer to this, the last, the latter part of that question is yes, I have. Um, but what I would say is, you know, as I as I will say, I, I, there's a lot of imposter syndrome for me when it comes to being a filmmaker and being on the uh, creative side of the industry, mostly because there are people who have gone to film school for directing, for writing, for cinematography, you know, and they never get to make a feature film, let alone two and several shorts and produce great works and develop books and, you know, and, and so like it is never kind of a, um, it's never uh, forgotten that I have been given quite an opportunity to do these creative endeavors without putting in uh, that kind of time I put in my own kind of time, but that kind of time that I think so many people like set out to do. Um, but all that to say, you know, it, it is a little cliche, but people always say, write what you know. And I think the only reason why I have made any kind of dent into the zeitgeist uh, of the industry is because that's the only tool and rule that I took with me was that I wasn't going to pretend to write something that felt so far outside of my own lived experience. And, and I think what resonated or what can, what resonates hopefully is the idea that my lived experience, though specific and nuanced to my own life, has some shred of universality to others that can see themselves reflected back into it, whether or not they equally identify with the, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of checklist of identities that I, uh, that I subscribe to. Um, and I think that is really the key is that like the more nuanced and specific and authentic your story is, the um, the more universal ultimately it will become. And I think it will ultimately lead people to see themselves and their own experience in the work. Excellent. And that's a really great segue to my next kind of question is, um, it's kind of a two-part question. So kind of going back a little bit to you know, you were talking about how your parents were not necessarily as supportive as you would have liked, although again, not because they hate art, but just because, you know. Um, yeah, exactly. What kind of advice would you give, I guess, students who um, deal with that type of background where their family's like, okay, yeah, go ahead and do choir, but don't make it a, a, a living or yeah, go ahead and make a film in class, but don't. And then I guess more broadly, what kind of advice would you give folks who want to get in the field in general? I think that uh, what I would say to anybody in, you know, li living in an environment now where they have um, primary relationships that don't know how to offer them the emotional support that they need for the thing that they want to do is to actively be conscious of the people who do have those tools and who are able to lift you up in the way that allows you to see the world in the way that you need to and want to see it. Um, I will never for one iota of my life vilify my parents for what they just didn't have the, 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 I keep saying it, but tools to give me, right? Uh, it's not their fault. And what I obviously in hindsight now can recognize is that so much of their decisions, and I think this is true for all parents, although I am not one, is that the decisions that are made for children are based in the parents fears and it's not necessarily fears around their children but maybe fears around 
whether what the community will say, fear that they will somehow get hurt, fear that they will not live a life that doesn't include the parent, you know, parents that might, I mean, my parents are always saying, when I die, you know, and it's like, okay, but just live your life now. Um, it's okay. Um, so I think what I would say is be really, really mindful of who your tribe is and be very conscious of what your voice is. Find your voice, find your tribe. What do you want to say? What are you interested in talking about? And who's going to uplift you to talk about it? I think those are the key things to find your own path. And, and look, I think it's very important to allow yourself the breathing room to say, right now, I want to be a huge writer. And in three years, if you think, God, I really like to be a staff writer on a TV show, um, that's fine too. You haven't failed yourself. You've just evolved in your thinking. If you want to be a director and then find out you actually much prefer editing, that's okay too. Give yourself the room to learn all of the different disciplines so that you know what it is that you actually do like. Right. Absolutely. That's great advice, Mike. Thank you. Because I know there's a lot of folks who are struggling with that thing where they want to like, you know, follow the path their parents want them to, but they also have like these passions, whether it's the arts or whatever the case. So I think it's really good, uh, really good, solid advice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking. I mean, I think, it, you know, looking at my own experience, I think that like I... Um, I was tunnel visioned. I thought I'm going to be on Broadway. Like it's just Broadway or bust for me, you know? And I, and, and frankly, I think that a lot of people were like, yeah, that's what he's going to do. And when, you know, after 9-11, my priorities just really shifted. Being an actor just wasn't enough of a storyteller that I wanted to be. Um, and I felt like, also, you know, I, I, my eyes were opened a little bit to the theater world being so white lensed and white focused. And I think I just was interested in telling other stories. So that's kind of what I mean by giving, giving yourself the room to like let your dreams evolve. You've done some amazing work, tremendous work. You mentioned All American Muslim, which is, is you know, a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, series, TV series. Um, we've talked a little bit about Brothers, um, which I, even just the name of the title makes me just want to sob openly um, for, for all the right reasons. It's, it's one of the most beautiful shorts that have, have still not left my memory. You have like just like this amazing like list of like projects you've worked on. And I've only like, I feel like just skimmed the surface with just a couple of those. Can you, uh, I guess, tell us a little bit about um, where we can find those, right? So like, I know I'm always telling my folks, like you've got to see Breaking Fast because like we screen it at the Arab American National Museum. You've got to try to find brothers. You've got to, so where can we see your work? Um, and then what are you working on in the near future? Breaking Fast, the feature is on Hulu. You can also rent it anywhere you rent movies. Breaking Fast, the short is on Amazon. Um, Brothers is on YouTube. Uh, another short that we worked on called Ubuntu is also on YouTube. Um, we, uh, uh, All American Muslim, it's a good question. I get asked this question and, and I don't know where it is. I think there are clips for sure on YouTube. I have DVDs of it, but where it lives digitally, I actually don't know. Um, we just celebrated the 10 year anniversary um, earlier this year of All American Muslim. And it was really fun to look back at it. Um, I just finished directing and I'm currently uh, in post-production on the film adaptation of Heather Raffo's Nine Parts of Desire, which I think we're gonna do something with in the coming months. Um, and so that to my knowledge is going to air on PBS in March of next year. Um, which is exciting to have a project that already has distribution attached to it. Um, and, uh, and then I'm coming to Detroit to direct a, uh, uh, the Detroit premiere of Heather's play, Nora, which she is playing Nora uh, at the Detroit Public Theater in, uh, in November it opens. Um, and uh, there are a couple of really exciting TV projects, one of which is a TV adaptation of Breaking Fast that I really hope the world will get to see soon where um, my, my, the, my 
production team and I are actively pitching it out to the market now. And we've been getting some really solid feedback on it. And I, I hope that Breaking Fast lives on in yet a third iteration. And it's a really, really funny, <laughs> really ridiculous uh, iteration that I hope uh, we get to make someday. Awesome. Well, we will definitely be on the lookout for all of the amazing projects that you have coming up. Um, you and I have also worked uh, on a very short five minute uh, film yes. uh, about the uh, LGBTQ plus community, uh, Arab American community, um, which, yes. is also, which is screening at the Arab American National Museum right now. So yeah, it's a sh short doc called Kullu, which is Arabic for whole. Um, because we should all live our whole authentic lives. Um, we're, we're immensely grateful to you, Dave, and the museum for commissioning that project. It was such a fun Zoom pandemic documentary to put together. And, and uh, actually, we are also talking about the possibility of seeing where it might live in the festival canon. So hopefully more news on that soon. Just personally and professionally, like, I really want to thank you for like the work that you do. And the fact that like you, you know, in addition to all the amazing stuff you do, I really like just appreciate that you sent her like Arab characters, you sent her queer characters and like just from, it, I, I, and it, again, in addition to many other uh, characters and personalities and things like that, but just being able to like see yourself uh, reflected on screen, whether it's Arab, whether it's queer, whether it's whatever thing that you don't, Muslim, whatever it's, whatever thing you don't often see, it makes, such an impact and I know people say that all the time and I'm sure you've heard that numerous times but it really does make like just like waves upon waves of impact to you know whether it's people trying to get into the industry or whether it's just people that are sitting trying to watch a great movie to see themselves reflected uh it just means the world so thank you so much for all the amazing work that you and your team do it it, it really makes an impact Thanks. Thank you, Dave. And thank you certainly for folks like you who are championing these works and making sure that they find an audience, you know, that that also needs its own uh, recognition. So thank you. And thank you to everyone at the museum for everything you do to to really cultivate um, Arab artists. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I think this is a great place to close out. So thank you again, Mike. And thanks uh, for DAF for having this amazing series ongoing. So uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, yeah, have a good day.